which I didn't mention was climate policy. And we've seen it in the chart. I didn't talk about economic sanctions. And you know, some of the reasons are not, say, shown in statistics. You can also imagine that there are sanctions, you know, against countries who are not, say, behaving properly. So if there are trade agreements in Europe, just imagine such agreements, then there's Brazil, for instance, but also Indonesia. And there is the idea to conclude trade agreements, Mercosur, an agreement has been negotiated four years ago, 20 years. That was the time for the negotiations. There's resistance now, particularly in Austria. So it is all about concluding this agreement, but there are obstacles. So this is very complex. Mercosur is a kind of large, large region. And if you conclude an agreement with a large region, then, you know, the, um, say, implications or repercussions will be different compared to having an agreement with New Zealand. New Zealand is much smaller. Now, I would like to ask uh, the head of the economic wise men and women, you know, here we do not think about climate policy only, but we also talk about, you know, the chances. Maybe we want to distinguish ourselves or separate ourselves vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. Now, how do you see, or the expert council, what is it the EU countries or the federal government is to do when it comes to trading off, you know, climate policies or climate targets, but also safety and other economic targets? Well, we explicitly said that the agreements which have been negotiated are really being implemented and that they are being ratified immediately and that you try to approach this situation when talking to other countries like the United States, for instance. But here we have to say we need diversification. There are good reasons why we cannot commit ourselves or, you know, devote our efforts to China as much as we did in the past. Diversification is also one of the reasons. Now, Mercosur countries, I think it is much easier to, to, to have an impact if you exchange ideas saying, okay, we leave you out there, then maybe things become easier. Well, a climate club. So if you do things like this or that, or whether you are going to do this or wait until people have, uh, you know, completed the development, or let's say we want to do, we want to do trade, want to have the trade, and then, you know, start thinking about how to regulate things. So this is a concept which people consider to be dead or ready. So this is change as a result of trade. Now, what about China? Is that, uh, isn't that the reason why we thought we would be able to have more influence over there because, you know, of new trade? But don't you think we should be more skeptical? The Mercosur countries, for instance, and there are some, say, local policies and Argentina, you know, the way they handle crises. But if there is more trade, and uh, this particularly refers to the agrarian sector, that nobody, you know, in this case, nobody can really give the assurance that everything will be all right at the end of the day. But this is only one reason why I can be skeptical. But are there other reasons as well? Or is that the crucial, the central issue at this, in this, in this? Well, you see, Mercur, no, this is a free trade agreement, isn't it? A big one. Okay, I would like to come back to your suggestion and what you said about this, you know, the, the, the backlash. And there was one reason, and this is the inequality. Inequality has risen, has increased. This is something which we have to take into account. Not everyone in the world will benefit from globalization. I think we have to have a closer look at that if you start concluding new agreements. Second point, and this refers to the Mercosur. Uh, this is what uh, Monica said. I don't think, you know, that this is policy in absolute terms, says we should undergo, uh, do trades, uh, uh, should not uh, be trading with them because there are problems. But the other question is, how can trade policy 
or trade politics with the European countries do uh, in order to bring about uh, changes, but also appreciate any changes or transformation which has taken place. So maybe you could, you know, coax people, you know, uh, say soft pressure, so to speak, or mild pressure, so to speak. So you just have to know what the standards are included in this or that agreement. Of course, you could also agree whether things should be done this way or that. But nevertheless, I think I can follow suit. I think if there's no contact at all, then things will certainly not be better at the end of the day. And the third point, over the last two days, we discussed a lot uh, about the multipolar world or the question whether there might be you know, different systems or order systems in this world. And of course, uh, this may sound counter uh, counterintuitive, but I can imagine that trade could be a currency, a channel to be in a position to keep up, say, the communication with, say, different systems. I think it is it is of elementary significance that we do not sell out specific standards. This is that's important. Well, this is something critics don't uh, want to see or believe. You know, CETA took a very long time until it was uh, ratified. Mercosur as well. So you you watch this, then you will become very very skeptical. Which interests are being say promoted? Is it all about selling selling our standards in order to have more trades, better you know more trading, more money? Well, not necessarily all my opinion, but I'd like to know. Well, let me comment on this briefly. I think, what are the specific contents which we are talking about, the ones, uh, you know, worrying us? Maybe other countries are not as democratic as we are. On the other hand, I can say, I go to the baker and buy the rolls, which I like, but what about music? Well, I don't like, uh, say, this other person's music uh, taste, but nevertheless, you know, I can be in touch with them. Let's say this person is criminal, and for that reason, I should be worried to some extent well, you see, there are many, many, say, differentiations uh, which we can uh, discuss. And we discussed it already today. You know, if you look at one's own position, what uh, democracy is and what is right in a democracy, and then decide we are going to do trading with them only, talk to them or those only, then I think you just limit your, 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 your scope of activities. But there are different playing fields, aren't there? The United Nations, different agreements, the human rights agreements. I think things should take place there and trade policies where well, they can, you know, go along, be, develop in line with them. Mass murderer? Well, I don't think we, should, we want to conclude a trade negotiation, a trade agreement with, say, these mass murderers. And of course, there are some in this world. But if we say we want to have democracies, and uh, then, you know, if we want to trade do t or trade only with those countries who really have the same standards as we, then not many countries will be left. Now, trade policies, then, then, then other democ uh, democratic policies, you know, there might be difference. But uh, Simon, you know, you are in the European Parliament uh, for Hesse, CDU. You are also in one of these uh, committees dealing with the foreign policy issues. I think it is very difficult, you know, looking at this Mercosur agreement, because for me and for others, it seemed to be conclusive. So we thought, okay, let's do it. We might be less dependent on China and then, you know, have, uh, say, more relationships with another trading partner. Would, how do you see that? Well, you see, uh, there is not only the classical green uh, direction, but also agriculture in France and Austria. They also want to have a say. That is, they are the lobbyists uh, being, or, you know, fighting this, you know. The Germans are not really on board in, in, in this case. Now, then meat production, that would be the increased, and this would lead to uh, some more problems. You know, sometimes there aren't really any facts uh, corroborating this, but nobody's re sometimes not really interested in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in facts. And meat production, meat production 
in Brazil alone is 11 million tons. So, and therefore the meat argument, Mr. Drexler, what's his name? So, now what I mean is, you know, I believe that uh, this person really got entangled in this agreement and can't find his way out. But nevertheless, in France, it's the same situation. There are some lobbies, lobbies of agriculture, and these many burdens which the European Commission has, uh, you know, decided on the Mercosur agreement is a kind of valve, is, uh, you know, something which uh, accepts, say, uh, so to speak, false of or, or wrong facts, then deforestation of uh, the forests and, uh, you know, the, the various values for this or that um, is, is zero, there's nothing, and be as a result of this agreement, there will not be any change. Then, you, need, you know, there were negotiations going on for 20 years, modern conclusions. There's also an agreement being discussed with New Zealand, sustainability agreement, so here, when it comes to sustainability, then the sustainability chapter in, in, in it is a legally binding one, but not the rest. For instance, the core labor standards of the International Labor Organization are being r ratified by the Mercosur uh, countries, that there are multilateral, say, environment protection, uh, protection agreements, then there is the Paris Accord, the Paris Agreement, and that there might be some some new populist uh, government in Brazil, and they will certainly, and this is what Mr. Bolsonaro always said, so they are not going to ratify things because uh, they wouldn't uh, they wouldn't oblige with uh, with some of the agreements. So talking about this, we have an influence which uh, we can say exert, which we didn't have if we. It, which we wouldn't have if we didn't, say, conclude this agreement. You know, WTO, it's not about the punishments, pen, uh, penalties, penalties, sorry. So we uh, want to, to, to punish them, fine them, then, you know, we want to have sanctions. And it will not work because the abuse rate is too high. But what I see, and this might be some kind of ancillary agreement it is a kind of incentive why do they deforest you know the rainforests you know it's uh, today it's no longer like this that uh, that uh, say a huge enterprise goes there and tries to make profit it is a social problem in brazil you see the individual farmer deforests a tree you know cuts off a tree sells it and then they kill live of that money for several weeks so it is a social problem in in brazil and also this kind of haughtiness on the part of the Europeans, you know, Brazil, you know, for 500 years, 500 years ago, you, uh, you know, cut a lot of the forests in Europe. So think about this before you talk to us. So you see, we have more influence as a result of this agreement and the alternatives, you know, not to conclude these agreements. It is quite clear what will happen then. The Chinese will go to Latin America, and they are there already. You know, the geostrategic importance is, and this is the strong argument in favor of such an agreement, it is not about increasing prosperity or wealth. Well, the Chinese, the Chinese imports of, um, you know, uh, commodities from the Mercosur, I think the quantities are the same, or the volumes are the same as those uh, uh, for or from Europe. Now, is there, is there something, you know, you can say, is there something which we means we pay the Brazilians, the Uruguayans, the Uruguayans and, and the Argentinians that they close rainforests? Well, this is in our interest. Why shouldn't we, we, why shouldn't we do that? There are always incentive systems which we could offer. It is certainly better than any colonial ideas, you know, the Europeans going over there and, uh, you know, they didn't pay attention to, to, to the environment for many, many, many years. And then they asked us to, to do that, to observe um, such things. But you see, within this legislative period, there was only one agreement concluded, the one with Vietnam, and all the other agreement on the, on, on, on the table, you know, New Zealand, Australia, they have been postponed, uh, Kenya, Chile, uh, updated, amended, and then there are uh, uh, there are agreements, negotiations with others, Indonesia. So things move very, very slowly, and then some issues which we see at the, at the Mercosur, 
you know, the oil which you mentioned, soybeans, palm oil, palm oil in, in Indonesia. So more or less the same problems. So the agreements which the European Commission concludes, now shall we, you know, limit them in terms of the competences the EU has? you know, social policies, etc., uh, other aspects are to be considered. But this would mean that we always have to have the, say, the participation, the co-determination of the parliaments, of the national parliaments in the respective countries. Now, what do you think? What does the European Parliament want? Is it, you know, Austria, I know, I really know, they want to have a say in all of this. But what, are, what about the EVP um, faction? Well, political and tactical reasons, you know, the, 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 the things are a bit, uh, say, difficult. CETA, critics said the world will, you know, see its Armageddon if we ratify this agreement. Then things were subdivided, the trade policy parts uh, separated, and this means we no longer need the, need the agreement of the parliaments. And at present, the Mercosur agreement is in the needle scrubbing phase, which means uh, people look at this or that chapter, try to work out interpretations, and I hope that the Commission really worked on this in technical terms to split up things. We know that there will be no agreement or approval from France and Austria, and then we can test it out, i.e. Uh, the Spanish, they now got the Council um, presidency, and then you know, we will see whether or not it will be possible to, to, to push such an agreement through the Council, even against the, even against the will of a large country like France. But, you know, government, I'm, I'm you know, Sp the, the Spanish. Well, you know, in Spain, we need a government, and of course, we also will have the European election campaign uh, starting. So, uh, maybe we've got the year 2023, which can be used to bring things together. I think it will be very exciting to see what will happen. That's uh, uh, really that really makes sense to mention this because if you look at the trade policy in the you know the right wings, the right populists, and they are in favour and the left is not. So uh, the question is how things will develop. Develop. Now I'm talking about export, export of values, so to speak, at Mercosur. Here we discussed this and uh, one or the other thing, well, that was disliked, but you might say we could use other instruments in order to pursue our objectives, not necessarily based on trade politics or policies rather. Now there are, uh, say, powerful, say, influences since January this year, Germany has got the supply chain duty of care law put into put into effect. So this, of course, affects the operations of a company. Surely nobody wants to have uh, child labor within the supply chain. But nevertheless, I assume I assume that this is the case. Now, this um, duty of care law, referring to the supply chains, do you think? Of course, when talking about the objective, we agreed that do you think that this instrument, you know, which is, uh, which obliges, which obliges uh, companies to, 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 to enact, do you think that this will be a kind of, uh, say, positive step, successful step, you know, monitor things and then verify things, etc., etc.? You know, don't you think that this is a very, a very political thing? which governments should deal with and not the companies. You know, the supply chain duty of care law, that's a kind of exception. That is, we are outsourcing things, meaning giving others a co-responsibility. And my impression, as I said, I'm not a trade expert. I'm just looking in from the outside, so to speak. I can say this uh, supply chain duty of care law, you know, child labor, and uh, you see there's a factory and there's a fire, 100 people die and nobody is really responsible, neither kick or other discounter and companies, you know, you know, those having their clothing or textiles produced over there. So now this uh, supply chain duty of care law is supposed to make this clear. And I believe the logic says, well, it's not only about uh, 
it's uh, it's about you know producing things in Germany or Austria, but this means you would also comply with certain labor laws, and this is what it is all about. You wanna you wanna comply with labor laws in other countries as well. Well, nobody would say anything if we ask people you have to comply with these laws in Germany or in Austria. But when it is about other countries, then sometimes things are a bit say vague. And I think I think you mentioned this briefly, I don't know, and we cannot see how things will develop or what the result will be. It is not about that the countries are not, say, willing to do things. It is just a kind of way of suggesting that they should look at the supply chain as well. You know, maybe people try to, 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 to comply with the respective laws, but at the end of the day, uh, such a building will collapse nevertheless and so and so many children will, 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 will die. Now looking at the infringements, social standards, all the other things, you know, all these things do not take place on our territory, in our domain. So it is all about the sovereignty or the, say, the, 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 the possibility to have access to things like this. And, you know, here I agree. The problem is that you want and have to give incentives and it is very difficult. You know, we are in Europe, but uh, things are to be done like this or that in other countries of the world. So there are, there are standards uh, which are defined, which we do not consider to be good. And surely, and this maybe brings me to the end of this, you know, these are the, these are the camps for the Uyghur. Uh, citizens in China, but you know, there are, there are products being produced there, and they are being bought here in here in here in Europe. So at the end of the day, then please do not buy these products. This you know, and uh, you. What I want to say is that you have to find your own way, your own approach. At the end of the day, I do not know whether this supply chain duty of care uh, law will really manage to bring all this about the positive effects. You know. Economists are not really, say, in love with centralist approaches. But what we see here is a radical decentralization. We've got a network and we've got 100 companies and they are trading with lots and lots of other companies. Then, So we have bilateral relationships. Now, if they all have to be monitored one way or the other, then this will be very expensive. If you monitor only, say, 100 suppliers, then you would have uh, fewer costs in the system as a whole well let me let me uh, kind of put forward a suggestion how you could get all this under 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 control first the idea you want and people want to look at these things how are things being produced in situ in this or that country we want to have a level playing field of course we do not want to have uh, local or domestic uh, production facility or production in general being at a disadvantage because we've got certain levels of safety um, uh, regulations which have to be complied with, which are not in effect somewhere else. So looking at the idea, I think it is correct. It is not necessary that we have the absolutely the same identical standards everywhere. This might not be necessary. You also have to take into account the living situation of people in other countries. Wages, salaries are much lower and cost of living much lower somewhere else. Now, can we burden or tax companies with this, you know, to, to, to monitor all this? This takes a lot of effort and uh, probably money. And, you know, sometimes uh, this was mentioned uh, in the morning. Isn't there too much red tape, too much bureaucracy? And of course, at the end of the day, everything has to be checked and monitored. And I can only say that this is a giant, uh, um, you know, some... You know what the Scientific Advisory Council said? Let us have a look at the countries and see, do we agree with what is happening there? You know, regulations about fire protection saying, okay, this is what we can live with. And then we might say, if you have suppliers from this countries, then this is okay, but not from other countries. And this, of course, would give the incentive to such countries to, to, to implement their standards in such a way that it is okay from our perspective. And then they can be included in the list. And then I think it will be very easy to monitor things. So at this point, you know, simple solutions, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that this is what we need. Yes, I, I, fully, I fully agree on that. This is 
something that has been enforced now for about nine months in Germany. We have a similar requirements in France, the Loire de Diligence in the Netherlands. Austria wants something like that as well. And to be very specific, this is also something that we could be talking about a European supply chain due diligence. Like they're working on that. They're making good progress. And if I th see things correctly, it's it's sort of a copy of the German law, a bit stricter, where these ideas of we can have the different negative or positive lists, this would not exist in the European law. How do you see that? This is something that has gone through the first reading in the parliament. Did you vote in favor of it? No. So if you have these positive and negative lists and amendments so that we could have such a law without these lists, would you then vote in favor? Would that be progress? No. Well, the problem is, and we just talked about that with Marietta, of the factory that collapsed. This is an important negative situation that has to be eliminated. No question there. The EU supply chain directive that was decided by the parliament, this is a bureaucratic monster for medium-sized companies. They simply cannot afford it, and it has no effect. And what is most the worst thing about it, and this was confirmed, there could have been an alternative that was transparent legally certain and would have been good with regard to bureaucracy without the negative list. We know pretty clearly, take textiles, for instance, there are maximum 10 companies in Europe which sell this stuff where you get a t-shirt for one year. You know that this can't work like that. If we put them on the list and you found that they come from the forced labor camp at the Uri Gurin and that they import something from them, then they're put on the list. They you have an import ban, and then it lasts for a year or two. This is something that has been solved in a pragmatic way. So I think we also have to say, and I saw this in Bangladesh, the textile industry after this collapse, a lot has happened then. then. It's not that nothing happened at all. No, but what we're doing here is something which is giving liability, and the states are no longer involved. We didn't even talk to the countries that are involved. And then we're coming up with a liability in civil law. Gesetzliche Grundlage, wo jeder im Verbandsklagerecht. Situation where the any lobbyist, any NGO can sue a two-man company. They don't only have to show where their stones came from and where the sheet that also packaged it. This is unbelievable, but unfortunately we don't have a public debate on this at a European level, and it's become even worse than in Germany. Well, Claudia Wiesner, what would you like to say? Well, I think this is excellent. I can go along with that, and I also agree with the critical monster description. I agree with that. I believe it right away. What I want to know is this is a trend that we talked about this morning as well. As a professor, I always have all sorts of bureaucratic requirements that I have to fulfill, fire safety, etc. I'm trained for this, but if I say I haven't been trained for this, then somebody from management say, okay, we can get, you can have training for that. You can have an online course for four hours. I don't have time for that. I really don't have time for such online courses. And that's something where I have been asking myself for the last couple of days. And I think that it's worth trying. We should have, we see growing complexity in a more and more complex world. And now someone has to assume responsibility. We don't want to do it. University doesn't want it. So maybe it's Professor Dr. Wiesner who would have to say, sign this if she goes to Brussels with her students. And we talked about the invoices, etc. And this is going to be a real monster when it comes to the red tape. So when we take this supply chain law, I see a certain trend. And we talked about that this morning as well. What should different countries do? And I think it's right for the responsibility not to be for the individuals or the companies. No, it should be the countries. So th then the countries, companies would have a different responsibility. Responsibility. Please document this, that, for example, beginning from the plastic wrapping. No, the responsibility would show us 
prove to us that you do not produce in countries that are on the negative list. And then you will, they will be cleared. You can do this once a year. And if there are any violations, then of course there would be sanctions. And if we can all sign on to this, then I think it would be good. And then the companies wouldn't have to do it. It would take much fewer people in the Federal Republic of Germany to monitor all of this. So I think if we take this as something for, so I do research on government actions, and I think that really, I really don't know where this individualization comes from and all this shift in responsibility. I don't know anybody who can give me a solution to this, maybe Max Weber, who said bureaucracies tend to grow. Well, I'm lucky enough or unlucky enough to have been together with the vice president of the EU parliament. I talked with her, she's from the Socialist Democratic Party in Austria. She finds that this is a wonderful thing. She says, well, there are companies that become richer and richer and they exploit their people. So these exploiting companies should then see to it that these bad practices are not continued. We had some discussions here, and I think in the background we can see this as a sort of anti-capitalistic feeling behind all of this. Maybe we're talking about these lists that would give us a system which would be easier for the companies, but others really don't want to be a burden for the companies. This would then maybe be a good thing because then they would always take the creme to the creme. Well, I... I don't want to say that from the very beginning. I assume that most people act for the best, but some of the means that they choose to do so are not the best. I think that's what we have to talk about. What means do I want to use to achieve these goals? We don't want exploitation. I don't think we need to discuss that at all. I think we all agree on that. We have the same target, but we have to see what means are really the best means. Can you tell us why this? so many companies want to put that offer onto somebody else? Maybe some could no longer be doing business with the developing companies for different reasons, but why there was a majority in the European Parliament. Can you give us an idea why with your arguments, why are you asserting yourself with your arguments? Well, okay, maybe we can ask you in the audience.